Alhamdulillah, we thank our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala who bless us to reach another Jummah, another day of Friday, which is a day of remembrance, and it's a day that we remind ourselves of the importance of the next world and the way that we are going to situate ourselves and orient ourselves and our position ourselves in this world in preparation for the next. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amun, idha nudiya li salati min yawmul jumu'ati fas'aw la zikrillah. That Allah Ta'ala says that, O you who believe, that if the call to prayer is called on the day of Jumu'ah, fas'aw, that hasten to the dhikr, to the remembrance of Allah. <coughs> and this is why that we have legal rulings that pertain from the time that the adhan is called the first adhan, that it's a time now that wadur al-bayt, as the ayah goes on, leave all transactions. This is a time for dhikr. This is not a time to engage in worldly commerce, and it's a time for focus. And in general, the whole day of Jummah, which begins the night before, because this is something that Muslims have forgotten, that they think that the only merit of Jummah is the actual prayer in and of itself, which is not the case. The whole day is special. But in particular, the prayer, because this prayer of Jummah is the best of all farai. It is the best of all of the obligatory prayers. But it's a day that Allah Ta'ala tells us, Fess out. Not just He could have said, Udkur Allah. But He says, Fess out. In Sa'i, Sa'a, Yas'a, means to hasten, to set out to do something. Fess out in Adhikrita. Wadar al That hasten to the remembrance of Allah and leave all transactions. And then we find the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, that إِذَا سَلِمَتِ الْجُمَعَةُ سَلِمَتْ بَقِيَةِ الْأَيَامِ That if Jumu'ah, if Friday is whole, wholesome, salima, that the remaining days will also be wholesome. In other words, that if we learn how to give Jumu'ah its haq and its right, and we look at all of the various sunan that are associated with the day and with the actual prayer and preparation before, and what happens after is that if we give it its right to the extent that we give it its right and focus on that day will be the, to the extent that it actually affects the rest of our week. Because the hadith also goes on to say, وَإِذَا سَلِمَتْ رَمَضَانَ سَلِمَتْ بَقِيَةَ السَّنَةَ And then if, you, if Ramadan is whole, meaning that you give Ramadan its right, is that it will directly impact the rest of your year. And Allah Ta'ala is giving us these windows in which that you have a special type of devotion, because your whole life is supposed to be devotion, but a special type of devotion through which you can accrue very beneficial things for your worldly transient life, let alone before moving on into the next world. So this is a day of remembrance. And one of the most important things that we can come to remember is the human condition, and if you will, the perilous state of the human condition. Because we are Bani Adam, and we, Allah Ta'ala has honored and ennobled Bani Adam. Bapak Karnamna Bani Adam, that we have honored, we have ennobled the son of Adam. Is that we have certain things in our physical constitution and our internal way that we've been structured, that we differ from other Allah Ta'ala's other aspects of His creation. There's different aspects between us and the animal kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the mineral kingdom. Although at the basic level of the elements, much of what exists and all of that exists within us. This is a scientific fact. However, there's something about the human being that science can never measure. There's something about the human being that no one will ever be able to possibly and truly hit it on the dot exactly what this is. And this is called consciousness, if you will. But in another sense, since it's related to this aspect of the human being, we have this ability to perceive. Is that we are not made of solely matter. Is that yes, we have an aspect of us that is physical, there's matter. But we're not solely matter. Our work is not related to this physical matter. And the proof of that is, is when we all die and we're laid six feet deep in the grave, is that worms are going to eat our physical body. So if the true greatness of human beings was related to something physical, then that how do you explain that? And it's funny that we're actually in a place where this is where people come to do fit to physically train their body, which is important. That we should never neglect the importance of exercise and of health 
and of taking care of yourself. This is very important, and this is from the deen. But we've come here for a different purpose. We've come here for a different type of riyadha. Because riyadha is the word that you would use for athletics in modern Arabic. But the way that our scholars understood the riyadha was very different traditionally. There's a different type of riyadha that is much more important. And it's a type of discipline that pertains to the soul of the human being. Because the human being is in a position because of their taklif, their legal responsibility that has been imposed upon. We didn't have this choice. And Allah Ta'ala showed the amana to the heavens and to the earth and to the mountains. That the, the, the mountains and the heavens and the earth, that they were showed this amana and they refused to assume it. But the human being assumed it. And this is the amana of legal responsibility which should weigh heavy upon our shoulders. And this amana is related to, as well, the susceptibility of the human being to rise to the adla iliyin or to fall to the asfad safarin That we could rise to the highest of the high or that we could fall to the lowest of the low. We, could, we have this potential to fall to a subhuman level, but at the same time we have a potential to rise to an almost angelic-like type of state, although we're still Bashar, we're still human beings. And Allah Ta'ala says, and He discusses this in the surah that we've all heard many times. In Surah Al-Teen, Wal-Teen wa Zaytun, Wal-Turi Sinin, Allah swears by the fig, and He swears by the olive. Wal-Teen wa Zaytun, He swears by the fig, and He swears by the olive. And then he swears by the mountain, he swears by Mount Sinai. In this secure city, that we've created the human being in the best of forms. Now, we, the outward form of that's obvious, because as a human being, that we walk upright, we don't walk on all fours, that we have an opposable thumb, we can use tools, that the physical form of the human being is distinct and it's unique. But we tend to forget that this verse also applies to the internal form of the human being, which makes us truly human. That when related to the intellect and our ability to understand language, the ability to understand concepts, the ability to name things, the ability to understand the future and recollect the past, this is something unique to the human being. The ability to have a heart that perceives, to have a heart that is a place that can is a receptacle, receptacle to receive mercy. This is distinct to the human condition. And so we've been created in the best of forms outwardly, but also inwardly. But also the human being can fall to the lowest of the low. And the way that that happens is they don't realize the special thing that their Lord has given them. Because for us as believers, that we have a special perspective. We have a different perspective. For us, is that everything is tied to a teleological goal. Everything for us as believers, that there's something else that it leads to. We don't see anything as fragmented. We don't ultimately see anything as compartmentalized. And this teaches us about the power of Tawheed. The power of La ilaha Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. And when you understand the power of Tawheed, this is the single most powerful, influential, important concept in human history. The power of Tawheed. And this is the essential message of all prophets and messengers. And then in terms of our understanding of knowledge, that for us, that the very pursuit of knowledge can never be divorced from the sacred. The pursuit of knowledge can never be divorced from the sacred. For us is that we're always tying it into something else. And if you look in that a lot of these departments on this very campus in which we're standing, and all throughout Western universities, is that you see a crisis in this regard. 
of truly understanding knowledge and how to understand and how human beings know. But Muslims have been given the keys. And we have the ability to root all knowledge. We have the ability to root all knowledge in a world view of Tawheed, of pure monotheism. And if you want to speak about it in mathematical language, is that every number, no matter how large it is, ultimately is a series of successive ones. Ultimately, it gets back to one. Two is one and one. Three, one, one, one. Four, one, 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 one. And so forth and so on. Until you have the highest number possible. And that everything that Allah Ta'ala has created has, in that sense, a limited type of number. Meaning that it's been numbered in that sense and it's been measured. And it's been delimited in a very particular way by the will and the irada of Allah Ta'ala. Ta because that the qudra of Allah, His power, that it brings things into existence with the irada, according to the divine will. But it is the divine will that specifies and delimits. And this is why that our scholars say in everything, it is a sign of the oneness of God. Because that we see in every divine choice, that we see that there's been preponderance. We've seen a, a choice that has been chosen. That in terms of the rational possibility, a number of things could have possibly existed. But that we see that a decision was made, that it be such and such, and this actually happened. And that this indicates to us that the active presence of our Lord in His creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because that we don't believe that Allah Ta'ala created the earth and then He let it run in and of itself. This was the Mu'tazilite belief. This was the rationalist belief. And incidentally, even some other pre Islamic religions, this was what they believed. That Allah Ta'ala created the creation and then endowed it with a power such that cause and effect intrinsically works in and of itself. That the dominant position of our theologians was that no, this is not the case. Is that every time that any effect happens, this very movement of my hand, these people behind me praying, everything that's taking place around us, the breeze, the trees, on the micro scale, on the macro scale, everything. Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala is bringing it into existence at that very moment, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you think about this, it's bewildering. And it's amazing. But they say that the disbeliever is bewildered by creation, why the believer is bewildered by Allah. And some scholars say that the name Allah, the Allah al Jalal, although the majority say it's a proper noun that refers to the Dat al Aliya, the sublime essence of God that gathers all of the names and attributes. That others say that it comes from a verb that we find the word walahan which is bewilderment. If you say in the Arabic language, Aliha, and Alihtu, Yani Tahayyartu, that I was bewildered, right? Perplexed in a good sense. You're bewildered by something that amazes you. But this is the human condition, is that we have the ability to rise to the Aliyin or the Asfad al So that begs a question then, what is the Aliyin? And if the scholars define the Aliyin, that is better left untranslated because any translation you're also going to have to translate from English into English to even the meaning. The Iliyin is a mold, it's a place in the highest level of paradise. It's a place in the highest level of paradise. And the others say that it's the place where Allah keeps the scrolls of the people that are going to attain the highest levels of paradise. And our Prophet is quoted to have said, Aksuru al Jinnati al Bula. The majority of people of paradise are simpletons. Whereas the higher levels of paradise are from the people of for the people of innermost core. For the people that have a higher level of not outward intelligence that we share with other aspects of Allah's creation, it's the higher level of intelligence whose place is the heart. We don't deny the mind and we think and the powers of the brain and the right left brain and so forth and Every, the side of the brain that's for memory, the side of the brain. So we don't deny that. Right? Definitely the mind, there's a reality to the mind. But there's a higher level of intellect which is solely for the believer which places here. That our scholars define it as a light that God casts in the heart. 
And that's a special light for the believer. And it's that light that helps us ground knowledge in this vision of Tawheed of which we were discussing. So this is the human capacities that we can rise to the Indian. And this was the whole purpose of the prophetic mission. Was that we have within us this potentiality. And it's when we're exposed to the verses of the Quran and the teachings of our prophets. Yet Shifaha that unveils it and it uncovers it. Because that were the heart to be a, some type of tangible sus, su, substance that we actually see and can measure. And I'm talking about the spiritual heart now, not the physical heart. That you would see that it has various layers. And there's different layers, Turakumat, as you would say in Arabic. These various layers that they have to be penetrated in order to get down to the depths. But it requires these layers come from that the human being in and of itself were born in a state of fitrah. And we all have in us what is termed as the sirah nafqa, the secret of Allah Ta'ala blowing the spirit into the human being in no anthropomorphic way. This is taken directly from a verse in the Quran. When fihi min ruhi, I breathe into him, meaning the human being, from my spirit. Every human being has this. Every human being has this and to the extent that we can come in touch with this true aspect of our nature. That when we enter into the world, that we get distracted. We have what are called shahawat, these various caprice that arises in the soul. That we're distracted by various things in this world. We're distracted by the mis misgivings of shaitan. That we're distracted by being around people of ghafla, of heedlessness. And one of the essential purposes of the Book of Allah, because its name is a dhikr one of the names of the Quran is a dhikr it is the reminder. It came to remind us of this pre-earthly covenant that every single one of us took. It reminds us of the very purpose of life, the purpose of this life, and it reminds us of the life that is to come. And that when we open our heart to those teachings, that what we find is, is that the human being starts to change. And the human being has the ability to transform. Because for us, that progress is not merely some type of outward development in construction. And we should be very careful, as our scholars always were throughout history, in defining our terms. This is extremely important. And that when we're exposed to modern words of vocabulary, that we have to understand that this is a crisis in the civilization in, we, in which we live. That read the book called Plastic Words. And you'll come to understand exactly what I'm saying. Is that many of these words that when we get into denotative and connotative meaning. That many of the words that are driving civilization. That many of these words are very problematic. And they're not easily defined. They're very ambiguous. But as in religious terms is that we're very careful about our terminology. We're very careful about the way that we understand things because the way that you understand things will be the affect the way that you ultimately deal with it. And it will affect that the results of how you deal with it. And so we should be very careful about our terms and for progress for us, true progress, is a moving of the soul from the states of nafs and amara, which is mentioned in the Quran, to the state of Mawama, which is also mentioned in the Quran, to the state of Mutma'inna, tranquil, which is also in the Quran. This is true progress for us. And this is the foundation of progress. And any type of outward religious progress that also corresponds to our understanding of progress is related to this ultimately. It can never be detached from that. And it's to the extent that we progress in this true way, is that we will progress in a way, in reality, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are entombed with the true nature of the reality. اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيد ابراهيم وعلى آل سيد ابراهيم 
وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا ابراهيم وعلى ال سيدنا ابراهيم واشهد ان الله الذي لا اله الا الله اله واحد ورب شاهد ونحن له مسلمون واشهد ان سيدنا وحبيبنا وكل تعينا محمد عبده ورسوله اما بعد يا عباد الله اني موصيكم ونفسي اياي بتقوى الله الحمد لله for us in closing that one of the most important concepts in realities that we have to reflect upon regularly is death. And for us, this is a positive motivating factor. It's not something negative. Because Muslims are supposed to come to terms with reality. And Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, وَعْبُرْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَحْيَةَ الْيَقِينَ That worship your Lord until death comes to you. And one of our great scholars wrote a book and in this book there's 40 volumes. He begins with the book of knowledge and he ends with the book of the remembrance of death and the afterlife. And a modern scholar pointed out that someone might look at this work and think that this is a type of appendix to all of these other topics of discussion that he presented. But the reality is, is it wasn't an appendix at all. That it was a culmination. And the meaning behind it is that there's something about the recollection of death, which is something we're all certain about. Even if people like Ray Kurzweil and others that are part of the Singularity Movement see death as some type of disease that they're trying to cure. No matter how many times and how much they freeze your body, you're going to die ultimately. This is a reality. Allah Ta'ala has written death. Not only are we going to die, we're all going to taste death. And according to the way we live, will determine is the way that we actually taste death. We're all going to taste death. But coming to that realization of that's something we are absolutely certain about. And what that does to the human being who really recollects the realities of it deeply, that it will motivate them and it will spur them if they are a believer, if they're a disbeliever, it should spur them to think about the topics and the questions of ultimate concern. If they're not, if they're a believer, it should spur them to take their life seriously. It should spur them to take a, to prepare for this inevitable moment that we're going to take our last breath. Our breaths are numbered. And what that, what happens to that is, is that someone, when they take this path, that they reach a level of experiential certainty, in other words, a transcendent point of reference, through which everything else becomes clear. So it becomes circular in that sense. Because that we have a lot to say about outward forms of knowledge and various classifications and categories of knowledge, which has been lost in our world in which we live. But we also have something else to say about how we ground knowledge and how we understand knowledge altogether. And that when we create this transcendent point of reference that comes through experiential certainty, which is the highest way to attain the higher levels of Iman, because our Prophet said, al yaqeen and iman kullu. Certainty is all of faith. And this is something that we have to all ask ourselves. What is our degree of certainty? Of absolute certainty. That Sayyidina Muhammad is the Prophet of truth. That Islam is the religion of truth. That Jannah is haq. That Nar is haq. That Yawm Qiyamah is haq. That the grave is haq. We should all ask ourselves this. And this should be our main pursuit, is that how can we engender in our own hearts a true level of certainty, where we don't lo no longer waver. And the greatest way to see where you are in the hierarchy in various degrees of certainty is quite simply look at the own state of your heart and look at your behavior. And this is why that the Sahaba said to the Tabi'een, the generation that came right after them, is that you all say things that we used to consider nifaq. It was a sign of hypocrisy in our time. And that if that was their state, what about 1300 years later? That, you know, they would have seen us and said that, you know, these people might not, they don't even believe. We should never despair them because that we are part of a tradition that will never break. And if you delve into it and you search, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up great doors for you, the great Imam al said, whoever opens up for himself a door to making a righteous intention, 
that Allah will open up for them 70 doors of the doors of tawfiq, enabling grace. If you make an intention, it's one of the most practical things that you can do, that you will see your life unfold and change before your eyes. And if you make strong intentions, you will see wonders of divine facilitation for you to attain those various things that you are, attend that you are intending. In the Allah wa malaikatahu wa yusalluna alindahi. Ya ayuhu al-dhin amanu sallu alayhi wa sallim wa sallima. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama sallayta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala Ali Sayyidina Ibrahim inna ka hamidun mujid. Wa radiyallahu ta'ala an sadatana khulafa rashidin Abi Bakr wa Umar wa Atman wa Ali wa alayna ma'amu fihim bi rahmatika ya arham ar-rahmin. Allahumma al-kul al-mu'minin wa mu'minat. المسلمين والمسلمات على حياة منهم ونبات ربنا تقبل منا إنك تسمي العنيم وتوب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا لا تؤاخذنا من نسينا وخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا سرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين آوكم الله نصركم الله أن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروا على نعمه زدكم ولذكر الله أكبر